Blessings, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time again to join me in another deep Bible study. We are living in the last days for sure. I hope you are safe, you're healthy, your families are safe and healthy, and you're taking advantage of the time to be together and to be worshiping and drawing closer to God. I praise God for the opportunity to get it right with the Lord, being indoors with our families. Let's take advantage of this time. Uh, I hope you have your word with you because we're going to get into a, a deep and an exciting study. The topic that we're going to study today, the question that we're going to answer is what happens when the latter rain falls? What exactly happens to you? What exactly happens to me when the latter rain falls? I'm very excited about this study. I hope you have your word with you because we're going to dig deep into God's word. But before I say another word, Let's have a word of prayer. Father, bless us. Thank you for the Sabbath. Bless us with your Holy Spirit, understanding, and joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise his name. These are some of the scriptures that describe the latter rain. I should say, talk about the latter rain, just some. And I put them up there because I want to encourage you to research them, check them out. When you begin to look at all the different scriptures that talk about the latter rain and you compare them all, you really see a clearer picture about the latter rain, the whole topic, when it falls, what happens when it falls. It really is an eye opening topic. So I encourage you to get as much scriptures that you know of in the Bible talking about this topic and compare scripture with scripture to get the whole picture. We're going to start our study in the book of Joel. You can go there and pretty much put a bookmark there because we're going to be visiting there several times. Joel chapter 2 and verse 23. Joel 2, 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion. And I hope you're glad right now because God is good. And rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former and the latter rain, in the first month. Now notice how God describes the latter rain in the very next verse. Joel 2, 24 and the floors shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil he describes or uses these three products to describe the latter rain go back with me to joel 2 19 you're going to notice the same three products yea the lord will answer and say unto his people behold i will send you corn that's interchangeable with wheat same thing corn and wine and oil and ye shall be satisfied. When God gives us the latter rain, we will be satisfied therewith. And I will no longer more, I will no more, sorry, make you a reproach among the heathen. Deuteronomy 11 verse 14 just further proves that these three symbols represent the latter rain, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season. The first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil here's my question why are these symbols used to describe the latter rain well when we begin to answer these questions we're going to answer the question for the study and the question for the whole study is what happens when the latter rain falls upon us so we're going to study these three symbols and do a little bit more study into some other scriptures we're going to paint a picture of what happens by god's grace when the latter rain falls the wheat or the corn what's going to happen when the Holy Spirit falls upon us, let's find out in our study about the wheat and the corn. Very short, very simple, this one. Psalm 78, verse 24. Psalm 78, verse 24. That picture has to give it away. And had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven. So notice what the corn is. It's the bread of heaven. It's manna from heaven. Now let's get a little deeper. Jesus makes it plain when he's speaking in John chapter 6. In particular, verse 51, he's speaking in context of the bread, the manna that came from heaven or the corn. Notice what it says. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. In the book of Joel, 
The first symbol to describe what happens to us when the latter rain falls is the corn. We just found out that this corn or this manna, this bread represents the presence of Christ himself. Jesus is the bread of life. If I feed upon him, and that's why when the latter rain falls, the Bible says when we get the corn, the wine and the oil will be satisfied. If we feed upon him, I shall be one with Christ in God. When the latter rain falls, you and Jesus are going to be one and to remain one, never more to be separated. You will be full with the fullness of Christ like you've never been full before. You will be satisfied with the fullness of the presence of Christ. The mystery will be complete, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Mystery solved, mystery complete. When the latter rain falls, God says, I'm going to fill you with my presence, the presence of the Lord, Jesus Christ. I hope you're excited about that. He's going to give us the corn, the fullness of his presence, the wine. What does the wine represent? Matthew 26, beginning with verse 27. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament. Notice what it does which is shed for many for the remission of sin. So it's emphasizing the forgiveness, the washing away, the doing away of sin. So the wine represents the blood of the new covenant, the blood of the new covenant. That word testament is the same word as covenant. That's why I'm saying covenant. Now let's notice the new covenant. And notice how the blood is even spoken of in the new covenant. Hebrews 8 verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. This is speaking of an inward conversion where God wants to give you his character and blot out yours. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Now notice verse 12 of the new covenant. This is emphasizing the blood for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. Will I remember no more when you give your heart to Christ, Christ transforms your mind and your heart. He puts his law where it should be in your inward parts. That's what Jeremiah 31 says. That means his law, his character supersedes your character and you're being run by the Holy Ghost, not by your selfishness. And another beautiful thing is, is that he remembers your sins. He blots them out. He forgives your sins because that's what the blood does. But why is the Holy Ghost or the latter rain spoken of as wine when we already re receive forgiveness of sins. Stay with me. Let's uh, 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 read some scriptures about the blood. Revelation 1 through 1 verse 5. And for Jesus and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, the blood of the new covenant. Hebrews 9:14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge, that word means cleansed, your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. When we call upon Jesus right now, he will give us the power to no longer have the desire to do those evil works, the power of the blood. First John 1 and verse seven, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So the blood of the new covenant in particular is the power of God to forgive and cleanse sins, the power of God to purge our conscience, to serve him and no longer practice those dead works. But Adam, that's something that we have available to us today. When the latter rain falls, it's going to be a special cleansing. Here's what I mean. Right now, there's a book of remembrance. There's a book of remembrance that records our deeds. 
I thought for a long time that this book of remembrance only records good deeds because that's what it says in Malachi. But I read a couple quotes from the servant of the Lord that made me think a little differently. Men may forget, men may deny their wrong course of action, but a record of it is kept in the book of remembrance. And in the great day of judgment, unless men repent and walk humbly before God, they will meet this dread record just as it stands. The judgment of the living will take place during the Sunday law crisis. And it's during this time that that book of remembrance, the books in heaven will be open. But I'm so thankful that it's going to be during that time that God is going to pour out the wine. It's during that time that the Holy Ghost is going to apply the blood. Acts 3.19, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Notice what happens when the latter rain falls upon us. There is a blotting out. The blood is finally applied on those books, the books of remembrance during the judgment hour, the hour of temptation, the Sunday law crisis. God will blot out the record. The blood will clean not only the records, but watch what happens to your mind and your memories. But while they have a deep sense of their unworthiness, they have no concealed wrongs to reveal their sins have gone beforehand to judgment and have been blotted out. When does it get blotted out? When the latter rain falls and they cannot bring them to remembrance. Now this, in, this quote in great controversy is speaking of the people of God when probation closes. They're trying to pull up some sins to confess them, but they can't remember any. You know why? Because when the latter rain fall, when the wine was applied, the blood of the new covenant. Their sins were not only blotted out in heaven from the record books, but it was blotted out from their memory. And this is the wine, the power to blot it out from the memory and blot it out from the books. I need some of that wine. Now her, her quote here in Great Controversy, page 485, speaking of the closing scenes of the judgment, the judgment of the living, notice what she says, thus will be realized the complete fulfillment of the new covenant, the wine, the new covenant promise, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more in those days. And in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for and there shall be none, praise God, and the sins of Judah and they shall not be found, won't even be able to remember them. When God sends the corn, the fullness of the presence of Christ, and you're going to be satisfied. He's going to send the wine, which represents the complete and final fulfillment of the new covenant, where God will wash away your sins out of the book of remembrance and even wash them from your memory. Now let's talk about the oil. What does it mean? What does it represent? Now I know what you're thinking, because I was thinking the same thing. Well, oil is the Holy Ghost. Well, remember that God is using these three symbols the corn, the wine, and the oil to describe the Holy Ghost. Let me say it this way. These three symbols are describing the latter rain. It's describing the work that the Holy Ghost will do. See, it's the Holy Ghost that will fill you with the presence of Christ, the corn. It's the Holy Ghost that will do a work on your mind to blot out the, the memory of sin the wine. So what will the Holy Ghost do with the oil? See, the oil represents the work that the Holy Ghost will do, not the Holy Ghost in particular, at least in Joel, at least in Joel. Here's what I mean. What's God, what's the Holy Ghost going to do with this oil? Mark 6 verse 13. Mark 6 verse 13. This study has me so excited. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil. Many that were sick and did what? Healed them. You see what the oil is pointing to? Healing. Don't you need some healing? I need some healing. James 5 verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with what? Oil 
in the name of the Lord. The oil represents healing. When the latter rain falls, there's going to be some healing that takes place. Notice Joel 2, 25. It says, and I will restore. Joel 2, 23, the latter rain. Joel 2, 24 describes the corn, the wine, and the oil, the latter rain. Then it says what it does. I will restore. That's healing to you the years that the locusts have eaten. Now, why are we going to need some healing? Remember in the previous studies in Joel chapter 1, 4 through 10, the locusts, Babylon, will come upon us. There's going to be some major persecution. And during this persecution, God's people will be betrayed, heartbroken, persecuted, ridiculed, destitute, abandoned. You're going to be messed up and you're going to need some healing. Joel 1 verse 10 says during this time of abandonment and hurt and pain that there's no corn, there's no wine, and there's no oil. That means we're going to have to bear this thing. We're going to have to go through a garden of Gethsemane experience. And Joel 2 verses 12 through 17 describes that experience. It's what Ellen White saw in vision in early writings. I want to say 269 to 271, where the people of God were praying and praying and, and, and the evil angels were surrounding them and, and with darkness as they did Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, where we're going to have to weep. We're going to have to fast. We're going to have to cry. We're going to have to rend our hearts and not our garments. And in response to the persecution, in response to the brokenness, in response to the Garden of Gethsemane experience, that angel is going to come down from heaven. As Gabriel came down to give strength to Christ, that rain is going to fall down and God is going to give us the corn, the wine, and the oil to heal us from the brokenness and the persecution and, and all the ridicule and all the evil that we've experienced, we're going to need some healing. And I'm so excited what God is describing in these verses. What's going to happen to us when the latter rain falls? I'm going to need some healing. And it's so important because when the latter rain falls, we're going to go forward and preach a message. And we can't be broken and down and, and down and out. God is going to have to heal us so we can preach a meal and a, a, a message of healing to others. Hosea chapter six and verse one. Come, let us return unto the Lord for he hath torn. God allows the persecution and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days, will he revive us? In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Now notice verse three. Then shall we know. If we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. But before the rain, when the rain comes, before the rain is persecution, he tears us. Then when the rain comes, he heals us. Notice this quote. If we keep our minds stayed upon Christ, he will come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. As the son of righteousness, he will arise upon us with healing in his wings. I'm so thankful that he wants to give us the corn, the fullness of his presence, the wine to blot out our sins with the power of his blood, even in our memories and from the books, the fulfillment of the new covenant. And he wants to heal us with the power of the oil. Now notice what else this oil does. It doesn't just heal this oil. I like to say amps us up. It empowers us to do the work. Notice Psalms 45 verse 7. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of what? Gladness above thy fellows. You know that this news that we're going to have to spread during earth's darkest history is a good, happy, joyful gospel. You know, it's good news. So God is going to give us his spirit of gladness. You know, that word gladness is interchangeable with joy. He's going to give us a spirit of joy. We're going to be amped up to go preach this message, completely healed and amped up, healed from our wounds, healed and amplified by his joy, his grace. Our faces are going to be shining with the oil of gladness. And it makes sense to me 
Because if the latter rain is the presence of God coming in, in its fullness, Psalm 1611 says, in thy presence is fullness of what? Joy. The oil is not just healing, it's joy. It's gladness. It's going to make you feel like you drank some coconut water times a hundred. You know, when I drink coconut water, it gives me energy. It invigorates me. It clears my mind. It makes me happy. This is, this is just a small ex an example of what may or what should or what will, I should say, take place when the latter rain falls upon you and upon me. And as I was further studying this topic, the Lord led me to Isaiah 61. Now let's go there. You're going to see, and I never saw this before, that Isaiah 61 actually describes what's going to happen when you receive the latter rain. It describes it so beautifully, what happens when we receive the latter rain, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. We're going to be mourning according to Joel chapter 2 because of the persecution. To give unto them beauty for ashes. We're going to be going through persecution, but when the rain comes, we're going to be beautified. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So we're going to be heavy. We're going to be mourning. We're going to be covered in ashes. But when we pray and God sends us the oil and the wine and the corn, it's going to beautify us. We're going to have joy. And instead of heaviness, God is going to give us the garment of praise. Now notice what happens. That they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now, after this heavenly transaction takes place, where he takes away your mourning and your heaviness, and he gives you joy and clothes you with praise and righteousness, when this transaction takes place, which I call the latter rain, notice what happens in the very next verse. And they shall build the old waste place, the old waste. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. What is this verse speaking of? It's speaking of Isaiah 58, in particular verses 12 and 13, the message of the Sabbath. Once God heals us, once he clothes us with joy and praise, once he empowers us with the latter rain, then we're going to go forward and build up the wall. We are going to proclaim the message in its fullness, like we've never proclaimed it before. I'm so excited about what the Lord wants to do in me when he pours out his latter rain. He's going to send the corn, the fullness of the presence of Christ. He's going to send the wine, which will cleanse us, the blood of the covenant, from the memories of sin and blot out the records in heaven, the complete fulfillment of the new covenant. And he's going to send the oil. It's going to bring healing to our souls, healing to our mind. It's going to empower us with joy and gladness. And we're going to go forward with our faces shining, declaring the everlasting gospel. Praise God. This helps us to understand when the latter rain falls, what will happen. But I'm not done. Let's continue our study. Joel chapter 2 verse 28. Notice what else happens when the latter rain falls. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. This is God's church in the last days. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Are you shy? Are you timid? Are you scared to speak the word? Because guess what? When the latter rain falls, something's going to happen to you, especially if you're the timid one. Thousands of voices will be imbued with the power to speak forth the wonderful truths of God's word. The stammering tongue will be loosed, hallelujah, and the timid will be made strong, hallelujah, to bear courageous testimony to the truth. May the Lord help his people to cleanse the soul temple from every defilement. And to maintain so close a connection with him that they may be partakers of the latter rain when it shall be poured out. I, listen, I want to have the latter rain fall upon me. What? I'm excited because I even want to speak in different languages. You know, I tell people all the time, I love French. I want to speak in French, you know, and, and I believe when the latter rain falls, God is going to give me the gift of tongues. If I'm in an, in an area that where people speak a different language, notice this quote. John says, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Then 
as at the Pentecostal season, the people will hear the truth spoken to them. Every man in his own tongue. Are you looking forward to speaking a different language? I don't know about you, but I am. Lord, I want to speak a different language. I want to preach the everlasting gospel in French. God can breathe new life into every soul that sincerely desires to serve him and can touch the lips with a live coal from off the altar and cause them to become eloquent. If you're like Moses and you feel like you can't speak and you're shy and you're stammering, remember what God told Moses. He said, Moses, I am the God of your mouth. And I could touch you and change that whole mouth of yours to do things that you never thought you can do. Speaking the wonderful truths and the words of life. I'm looking forward to that day. Revelation 18 verse 1. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven. This is the latter rain. Having great power. When the latter rain falls, you're going to have great power. That word power we've studied in previous studies is the word exosia. It means authority and influence. When the latter rain falls, you're going to have authority and influence. Mark 1 verse 22, Jesus had authority and they were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one that had authority and not as described. When you speak, when the latter rain falls upon you and you're speaking in French, those French people are going to, their mouths are going to drop because you're going to speak to them, not only in their language, but with authority, with power. You're going to cause jaws to drop. And as your face shines with joy, that joy is going to be contagious. And if they send the police at you, the police are not going to be able to arrest you. Just like when the police tried to arrest Jesus, what did they say? They said, never, man. Never a man spake like this man. And when they come to you, because they're hearing the words of life, the words of authority, the words of power, the words from the Holy Ghost, they're not going to be able to arrest you. Never a man, never a woman has spoke like this man or woman. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, when Peter began to preach, the Bible says they were pricked pricked with the word of God that were penetrated into their bone marrow. And they, they couldn't help but ask one question. What must I do to be saved? Somebody tell me or show me where the baptismal pool is because I need to get dipped by this brother and by this sister preaching with authority and with power. Can you imagine what's going to happen when the latter rain falls? I heard those clothed with the armor speak forth the truth with great power. It, had effect. Don't you know that when I preach, when you preach right now, it doesn't always have effect. Some people will harden their hearts and run away. But in the last days, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, it doesn't matter how hard the heart is, that word will penetrate like a missile, like an arrow straight through the heart of stubbornness and cause conviction. And that's how every man, every woman, every child will know what the truth is about God's law. We'll know what the truth is about God's Sabbath. And everybody on the face of the earth will be able to make a decision. Do I serve the Lord or do I serve the devil? The message will go forth with power and they will know to come out. They will know that time will be running out and there will be a harvest of people coming out of Babylon. Let's continue our study. This is one of my favorite parts as we're coming to a slow landing. Joel 2.28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy with power, authority, and in different languages. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Hold on, hold on. Let's break this down. When the latter rain falls, Dreaming of dreams and visions is going to be prevalent. Now, I said, Lord, what do you mean? You know, my mind automatically went to Daniel and John the Revelator. I said, Lord, are we going to be seeing statues and beasts? What, what do you mean, Lord? And the Lord directed me saying, no, 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 no. You're not going to be seeing dreams and visions in that context. It's going to be in a different context. Notice what I do, God says, with dreams and visions. Numbers 12, 6. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. Now, notice God is not saying he's going to make us all prophets, really. 
What he's saying is that he's going to open up channels of communication that are not really opened up because he communicated to the prophets through vision and dream. Now, in the last days, he's going to open up channels of communication to his people through visions and dreams. Don't you know in a war, the most important thing to have in war is communication. It's not your weapon. It's not your ammunition. The most important thing is, is communication. You're going to need to get in communication with headquarters because headquarters is the eye in the sky. Headquarters has the bird eye view. They can see the position of the enemy. The, the headquarters can see where somebody needs to be saved. Headquarters know where, 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 where the allies are and they're trapped. And so headquarters can say, I need you to go over here. I need you to go over there. I need you to stay put. I need you to be here for two days. Headquarters communicates to those on the ground what's going to happen, where they need to go, what weapons to bring, what to say, and what to do. Headquarters is heaven. God is going to open up the channels of communication, visions, and dreams. And in these last days, when the latter rain falls, he's going to be communicating present truth for present situations to move and direct his people with what to say and where to go. Notice the word of God here in 1 Samuel. This is a powerful thing. First Samuel chapter three, verse 15. And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Now, what was the vision that Samuel saw? When you read first Samuel chapter three, first Samuel, I mean, Samuel heard God speak to him. Now notice what the Bible calls that a vision. God literally spoke to him and said, Samuel, Brother wasn't used to getting spoke to God, like, to God like that. You know, right now we hear the word of the Lord. But when he starts to give us visions and dreams, we better get used to hearing the word of the Lord like Samuel. He said, Samuel, he didn't know what to do. He went to Eli. He said, Samuel, he went to Eli. And then the third time Eli says, you know how to answer. Say, here am I, Lord. Your servant is listening. And then he spoke to him directly a present truth for a present situation. And he began to tell him about Eli. I had enough of Eli. I've warned Eli. I'm about to do something wonderful in Israel because of Eli and his sons. The vision that Samuel received was a present truth for a present situation. Let's go to the New Testament. Matthew 2, 12. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. God gave the wise men present truth for a present situation. And he said, listen, 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 don't you go back to Harry. You need to go a different way. God is going to communicate to us in the last days through dreams and visions, present truths for present situations. He's going to warn us in a dream, say, listen, don't you go down to that, to that city this morning and preach the word. You need to stay where you are because there's a trap there waiting for you. God is going to open up channels of communication. Matthew 2, 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Can you imagine getting a warning from God himself? You see, he has to open up and pour out his spirit. And we're going to see dreams and visions because we're going to be in a dangerous situation. You're not going to get uh, detailed instructions about somebody trying to kill you per se from the word of God. So he's going to have to literally tell you in a dream and in a vision you need to wake up right now. There's enemies coming to seek your life. Go run to the hills. God is so good. He is so good. Let's see this in Acts 9, 10 through 12. What's going to happen in these last days? And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, behold, I am here, Lord, just like Samuel. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight. Notice the detailed instructions from headquarters. And inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. 
dreams and visions. Okay, this is what God is going to do in the last days. He's going to give you, he's going to give me a dream and a vision. And he may say, Adam, I need you to go to the corner of Laguna and Bruceville to the Chevron gas station. And when you get there, there's going to be a brother named Antoine. He's going to be wearing a black hoodie. And he's going to be waiting for you. And at the very same time, he's going to give Antoine a vision and say, Antoine, go to the Chevron and wait there for my servant, Adam. He's going to be wearing a gray hoodie. Praise the Lord. And you're going to meet up together. And that brother's going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Can you imagine the communication that God's going to do? Acts 10, 1 through 8, he gives Cornelius a vision. And then at the same time, he gives Peter a vision and he tells those two brothers to hook up. Acts 10, I'm sorry, Acts 16, 9 through 10, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Now, I hope you don't think I'm stretching this thing. I'm just using scripture. Now, the book of Joel said that we're going to have dreams and visions. I'm going through scriptures to describe to you what dreams and visions are. God will be communicating to us present truth for present situations. We may receive a dream just like Paul did. We may see somebody crying out in Utah saying, come to Utah, come bring the gospel in Utah. And then we may wake up and pack up the family and the family say, where are we going? We're going to Utah. God came to me in a vision and I saw, actually, I saw people in Utah crying out. And so we got to go there and preach the gospel. Acts 18, 9 through 11. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. What does he say? Be not afraid, but speak. And hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. This is when Paul went to Corinth, and he started to get a little afraid. Lord, am I in the right place? Should I be here? Then God gave him present truth for a present situation, a vision to communicate to him You need to stay where you are. In the future, God may send you to Utah to go preach to the Mormons. And it may be hostile territory in the last days. You may begin to wonder, am I in the right place? place? Am I here uh, really of the Lord's bidding? And he may give you a vision to say, don't you go nowhere. You need to stay put for I'm with you. My angels are on the ground and you don't have to worry. Preach the word because I have people in Utah that will hear and be receiving the Holy Ghost just as you. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. What happens when the latter rain falls? In summary, the corn filled with the fullness of Christ, the mystery complete, the wine, the covenant will be fulfilled, the sins blotted out, and even from our memories, the oil will be healed healed and filled with joy, rejuvenated to do the work, will prophesy, the Bible says, speaking with power, authority, boldness, and by God's grace in French, with authority and influence, every word we speak will convict the soul. And finally, God is going to communicate to us in dreams and visions. The general is going to open up the channels of communication to give us present truth for the present circumstances that we find ourselves in. What a God we serve. So who wants the rain? Do you want the rain? I hope this study has excited you, excited you and inspired you to strive to be in the position to receive the outpouring of the latter rain. Those who come to every point and stand every test and overcome, be the price what it may, have heeded the counsel of the true witness, and they will be fitted by the latter rain for translation. Father, thank you. Thank you for this Bible study. Lord, we want to be filled with the fullness. Lord, we want the sins in the books of remembrance to be blotted out. 
and even the memory of them. Lord, we, we need oil, even a taste of it now to heal us and to empower us, especially during this time uh, of earth, uh, a crisis that we're going through, a present crisis. And Lord, we're looking forward to this latter rain. We'll, we will be able to communicate what God has done for us on a level that we've never communicated it before. Full of joy, full of power, full of authority. We're even excited, Lord, to hear your voice as Samuel did, as Ananias did, as Paul did in dreams and in vision. What a privilege that during the latter rain, you're going to be so close to us. You're going to open up channels that have been closed for a while. Oh, God, we thank you and we praise you. Bless us and our families to be faithful. And in Jesus name, thank you. Amen. Neither be thou dismayed.